Bonsoir à, à tout le monde. Bienvenue à, ce soir au Moudam pour cette conversation avec l'artiste Zoé Léonard et euh, qui marque en fait l'ouverture de son exposition El Rio uh, to the River présentée dans le musée au, à, au premier étage. Uh, I'm going to speak in English uh, tonight because the conversation will be in English. Um, which I hope uh, is all right for everybody here. Um, try to speak clearly, that in this wonderful polyglot nation of Luxembourg, I don't think we should have any problems. Um, I'd just like to uh, begin by just framing this conversation uh, beyond the fact that it coincides with the opening of Zoe's exhibition. Um, just to say that it's the first in a series of events that have been programmed by the public program team and the curatorial team here at Mudam. So we have our conversation this evening. And then on Saturday, uh, Saturday morning at 11 a.m., I believe, there will be a not-to-be-missed <laughs> event, uh, which where Zoe will once more be in conversation, but with the remarkable Tim Johnson, poet and editor, um, who is here with us this evening and who is the editor of the beautiful uh, book, uh, El Rio, which you can see, I think, when you leave the auditorium, but also in the bookstore. And um, Tim has actually traveled all the way from Marfa, Texas, uh, to be with us. And he will be in conversation with Zoe and also contributors to that extraordinary book, Elizabeth Lebovici and Catherine Fasarius, who are both here with us this evening, and thank you. But that should be, that in a way, the way with Zoe we conceived of the program was this is sort of a part one. This is part of the egg, if you like, and then the other part of the egg is, is on Saturday. Um, but there is, um, throughout uh, the course of the exhibition, there are a number of really um, significant events, uh, lectures, screenings, um, conversations that are organized. And just to let you remind you about a number of them, um, in May, uh, Zoe Leonard, a scholar, academic and curator um, who is renowned for her, for her work uh, as, a, as a professor of history of art, but also for her exhibitions of um, uh, uh, Brian E. Fair. Brian e. Fair. Yeah. Said oh, did I? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Brian E. Fair. <laughs> mm, nee. Sorry, I started again. Brian E. Fair, Professor Brian E. Fair, who's a professor of history of art at the University College um, Uh, London and who uh, recently curated a remarkable exhibition for Tate London um, on Annie Albers called The Pliable Plane, but she's curated a number of uh, remarkable exhibitions over the years. So Bryony will be here in Luxembourg speaking at Moudam then in early May. Um, a symposium, a very impressive symposium is has been organized for later in May in collaboration with the Um, Center for Border Studies at the University of Luxembourg and their Department of Geography and Spatial Planning. Um, also the uh, Saarland Museum and their Department of North American Literary Studies and the University of Trier and their Center for American Studies. Um, and the discussion, uh, the subject of that symposium will be on rivers and other border materialities. And then there is, I don't have the full list here, but please do go onto the website and look for the program, but an extraordinary film screening series which will include the screening of films by Mexican directors as well as European directors, some American directors. And I believe that there's a radio evening as well um, that, oh, Tim, you have to prompt me, but... Um, uh, on Wednesday evenings and... So that should be really wonderful, and you'll hear a little bit more about the importance of music and, and these songs, um, I think, on Saturday um, from Tim. So first event this evening, next event Saturday. Don't miss it. 
Um, so I'd like to just begin our, uh, sort of precede the conversation with Zoe this evening with a very brief introduction. Um, who is Zoe Leonard? Zoe Leonard is, I think it's fair to say, one of the most acclaimed artists of her generation. Her work has been the subject of major exhibitions in the United States and in Europe, including solo exhibitions at uh, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, Dear Art Foundation, New York, the muse uh, in Europe in the Museum of uh, Modern Art uh, of the Ludwig Collection in Vienna, um, among others. Zoe has also participated in important international uh, exhibitions such as Documenta 9, in Castle in 1992, Documented 12 in 2007. She's also participated in the Whitney Biennials of 1993, 97, and 2014. And I think it's interesting to understand the, the significance of these biennial and quinquennial um, contemporary art events because uh, Zoe's representation in them also is a reflection of her relevance um, throughout uh, the last three decades, coming on to four dec decades. In 2018, the Whitney Museum of American Art accorded Zoe uh, a retrospective exhibition survey, which subsequently traveled to LA Mocha in 2019. So, um, and here we ha actually have a view, you can recognize the Hudson River there, but um, a view in the Whitney uh, in New York. Known for her monumentally scaled photographic projects, Zoe has also created sculptural and site-specific installations that have become iconic works of art for the late 20th and early 21st century. And these installations, many of them are to be found in museum collections that include, again, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Guggenheim Museum in New York, the Philadelphia Art Museum, the Rena Sophia in Madrid, and Tate in London. Among the many now iconic moments in her career are, um, as I mentioned earlier, Documenta 9 in Castle. And I think we might have a picture where we'll go to that. Um, he, just here, um, uh, the doc Documenta 9 was curated by the legendary curator Jan Hurt. And um, Leonard was invited to show, and she created a work um, which she installed in Castle's Neue Museum um, within its collection of 18th century German portraits with what uh, the New York Times uh, art critic Robert, Roberta Smith described as chaste black and white photographs of women's genitals. A reference to Gustav Courbet's famous painting, The Origin of the World, that made manifest the male, ga male gaze, which feminist art theory holds most, holds most art is made for in a way that was shockingly direct, funny, and rather beautiful. Unquote. Um, Leonard took her own New York neighborhood, Manhattan's Lower East Side, as a point of departure in the late 1990s for her now iconic project, Analog. Um, the work documents uh, uh, document the work Analog documents the eclipsed texture of 20th century urban life, as seen in vanishing uh, mom and pop stores, as they're known in the U.S., and the simultaneous emergence of the global ra rag trade or textile industry. She then, uh, Zoe, then followed the circulation of recycled mer merchandise, used clothing, discarded advertisements, the old technology of Kodak camera shops, to far-flung markets in Africa, Eastern Europe, Cuba, Mexico, and the Middle East. Conceived over the course of a decade, Analog comprises over 400 black and white photographs organized into 25 chapters. And Analog um, is now to be found in the collections of the Rena Sofia Museum in Madrid and also in the Museum of Modern Art in New York. From the late 80s and through the 90s and 2000s, Leonard embarked on photographic projects addressing landscape, maps, and aerial views, bringing uh, bringing to them questions of subjectivity and the photographic gaze and the embodied photographic gaze. In 2008, she presented her conceptual photographic work, You See, I Am Here After All, commissioned by Dia Beacon uh, in upstate New York, comprising some 4,000 vintage postcards. And I think you're picking up on this sort of idea of number. 
um, sourced mostly online and dating from the early 90, from the early 1900s to the 1950s, the work's repetition of this emblematic site of Niagara Falls, um, an emblematic site of natural beauty, um, and draws attention to the ways in which cultural conventions and artifacts have mapped and defined both the natural world and our understanding of it. Running through many of Leonard's photographic works and installations are themes of journey and displacement. A committed activist since the 1980s and into the early 1990s, which was an era marked by heightened political awareness of the overwhelming losses to the AIDS pandemic, um, led, uh, this era led Zoe to write the manifesto, I Want a President, in 1992, same year as Documenta, in support of the poet Eileen Miles' presidential bid as an independent candidate alongside George H.W. Bush, Bill Clinton and Ross Perot. The piece famously begins with the words, I want a dyke for president, I want a person with AIDS for president, president and I want a fag for pre vice president, and I want someone with no health insurance. And it goes on. Leonard revisited the text which had become, uh, begun to circulate widely in the form of a postcard and the text was installed subsequently on a monumental scale on the High Line in New York City at the time of the 2016 presidential election and became a viral sensation on social media. I think we have an image of it there. Leonard returned to her words on the eve of the 2020 president, president presidential election, an event marred by the COVID-19 crisis, economic disruption and nationwide demonstrations against institutional racism and police brutality. Stating, and I quote her, I am interested in the space this text opens up for us to imagine and voice what we want in our leaders, and even beyond that, what we can envision for the future of our society. I still think that speaking up is itself a vital and powerful political act. Two decades apart, I want a present president and El Rio to the river invite us to look closely and from myriad perspectives at the social and political landscape of our times so that we might imagine an ethics of a shared world and of a common humanity. So coming to the work itself, El Rio, um, the exhibition that we are opening this evening is the first presentation of um, this epic photographic work. The work, I think, I can say, comp currently comprises some 450 photographs, we, um, of which uh, some 300 are presented in the, 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 the presentation here um, in the museum. Um, the photographs uh, were taken as Zoe um, made a journey, um, stopping and starting, but traveled along uh, the 1,200 mile, or approximately 2,000 kilometer section of the Rio Grande, Rio Brava, that constitutes uh, the border between, or part of the border between the United States of America and the Los, Los Estados Unidos de Mexicanos, um, Mexico. So it begins at, um, uh, El Paso and Ciudad Juarez in Mexico and runs to Matamoros where it flows into the Gulf of Mexico. Um, I think it's interesting to note that that border and the recognition of the border that then extends beyond um, overland was only defined in the 19th century. So much like in Luxembourg when sort of final territories and demarcations of the Grand Duché were recognized after the treaty, I think the Treaty of Brussels, 1849, the, for, uh, the fortifications of the city taken down in the second half of the 19th century. It, similarly, this border with between the United States and Mexico was only defined in, this, in uh, the mid uh, 19th century. Um, what you will see in the exhibition, we'll talk a little bit about tonight, landscapes, desert and mountain regions, cities, villages different activities around agriculture, around commerce, around industry, policing, and surveillance. Um, we, we see what Zoe bears witness to and offers up to us in her work is the materiality of the border as infrastructure, as built environment, um, but also as um, 
as something that is that cannot necessarily be harnessed, which is the river, the river valley, the riverbeds themselves. Uh, we see the control of water, we see the control of people, the control of the passage of goods. Um, we And we also see uh, people living their lives, daily life. As Leonard has said, and this is the last quote before we enter into the conversation, I'm looking closely at the river in order to observe the multiple and complex pressures that bear down on this thin line of moving water. This, walk, this work is a way of thinking about a larger social and political landscape. So, Zoe. <laughs> so what got you, what got you started? <laughs> Hello. hello. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I actually feel like that was such a beautiful introduction that we're done. Like, <laughs> we can all go home now. Um, oh, thank you. That was really beautiful, Suzanne. Um, what got me going? Um, uh, well, there's a long answer and a short answer, so I'm going to try to go for the shorter answer. Um, shortly after the election in 2016, um, I was in West Texas where I spend a lot of time and I had, I had, a, I wanted to, I actually didn't want to do street activism. I didn't want to go back to doing direct action. Um, I wanted to stick with my work. And um, I had spent a lot of time sort of camping and hiking around the Rio Grande, Rio Bravo area in the national parks. And this one day it occurred to me, I thought, if I follow this river, this river um, cuts essentially a cross section, not only through this 2,000 miles, 2,000 kilometers of land, but it gives you a cross-section of contemporary society. There's um, climate change issues, there's issues of drought and water usage, there's histories, the Camino Real intersects, um, so you have a history of the conquistadors and early colonialism, you have farming, you have ranching, um, you have big cities and small villages, oil and gas concerns, a lot of law enforcement, border, uh, border control, immigration. And I thought, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna do what I love, which is to take pictures. And I wanted, I, I had this, I wanted to get outside of the narrow kind of binary thinking of like um, Democrat and Republican, black and white, us and them, two different countries. I wanted to, pull out a larger, I wanted to understand a larger sense of who we are right now, what we're doing, what we've built, um, and a way of examining the border of the country I've lived in my whole life was a way of thinking about our relationship to the rest of the world. Um, so, yeah. Um, I know. I know that the process for creating the work in late 2016 involved numerous stages and collaborators. Could you tell us a little bit about that process? Um, yeah, I mean, we're going to be here all night. But, um, uh, well, I began photographing, um, uh, sort of bringing... Um, I had a couple of different assistants that helped with the first through uh, first few um, photographic trips, um, but very early on, I got into conversation with Tim Johnson, who is now the editor of the book, and Tim and I began going out on trips together about a year in, year and a half in, and I was still working also with um, a couple of different assistants at different times, but. Um, at some point it became really clear that the conversation Tim and I were having, that, that, that he should be the editor of this book that I had imagined making, which was completely not a real thing or even a possibility at that moment, but I was somehow convinced we would do it. Um, so Tim was a huge collaborator um, going out shooting together, but also having long conversations in these very long truck rides and long walks and long, long days in the in the sun, 
trying to interpret what we were seeing, trying to understand, trying to read the landscape and read the built environment, um, which was all um, new to me, sort of understanding how the dams worked, how the bridges worked, um, what was allowed, what wasn't allowed, the kind of really intense surveillance presence along the border. Um, and then the, there have been, I mean, I, uh, so Elizabeth and Katrine who are here were kind of my, um, one of my um, like centers of gravity. We would meet um, over Zoom and look at pictures together and talk about them and refine the ideas. And we spoke a lot about Gloria Anzaldúa and her legacy in terms of borderlands theory great conversations about um, how this, in fact, this set of concerns um, is not limited to the U.S.-Mexico border or the Rio Grande, Rio Bravo River, but that this set of interests and concerns is something that um, really is applicable globally. Mm -hmm. um, questions of um, how we use um, our natural landscape, and I say the word use really particularly, the idea that it's there for us to use, that the water is ours to take, um, and our relationship to borders and our relationship to our neighboring countries. And so I began to think of this as a project that wasn't only about the country I live in, but a kind of set of questions that we really face globally at this moment. And you had a number of... Um, could you talk a little bit about some of the challenges of uh, photographing and certain being in some of the places yeah. you were? Yeah. Um, wow. Um, how do I say this? There. Are, so we're talking about a 1,200-mile stretch of river, um, I didn't photograph in order. I made multiple trips to different places and reading and researching along the way. There are sections of the river, like through Big Bend National Park, um, where there are some challenges, like it it's, it's can get really, really hot. Um, there are snakes, there are spiders, um, but it's incredibly beautiful and it feels safe, like you really feel like you can move very easily through this beautiful landscape. Um, there are other areas where um, the sense of a heavily militarized security, um, um, like the, the law enforcement is very tangible. Um, it's very visible and because my charge that I had given myself was to photograph the river, I was always trying to get as close to the river as possible. And that meant being directly in the zone that was being patrolled. So it, it meant that we had a lot of, a lot of contact with law enforcement, um, which is not something I was used to, um, as we've spoken about before. But um, I'm not a photojournalist. I you know, don't work for a paper. I don't have a press pass. I wasn't trained as a uh, war photographer. I'm an artist you know, from New York. And Tim, who was going out on a lot of these trips with me, is a poet. And we were like, meh. You know, we, were kind of <laughs> we were like, well, we said we wanted to do this. It's a great idea. And then you're like, mm, do, do, we, do we want to be here right now? Um, so that learning how to move in a very, very tense environment where um, there are um, very serious um, operations going on and where there are, you're, there are a lot of heavily armed people and you're the only people that d aren't armed and where you're an unknown quantity, um, where you're not quite sure how you're being read, that was really tricky and we... I say both me and I think Tim and I, as we began working more closely together, um, both had an, an attitude we wanted to strike, which was of calm and that we were there to do our work and um, 
to be non-confrontational, but also to never lie about who we were or try to gain access to anything. Um, it was really photographing what was in plain sight and what I, we could access um, as far the, to the limits of what my citizenship would allow me. And I never crossed a no trespass. I never um, broke a law directly. But we were in a zone that was really a gray zone um, where there isn't a lot of civilian activity a lot of the time. So your presence there is, is not usually welcome. Um, and yeah, and then there are areas where there's also a lot of illegal activity happening. Um, there's narco trafficking. Um, and then I'm moving around with a camera, and there are people crossing um, for various reasons and uh, that really don't want to be seen. And I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to engage in any kind of um, I didn't want to take on a role of revealing anyone or even revealing anyone's face. Like you'll notice many of the photographs are taken from a distance where you can't really recognize people because it's, I don't know what people are doing and I didn't want to make the situation singular or personal. I was trying to look at larger structures and how they function. Um, so finding Maybe the biggest challenge, actually, of all of it, um, aside from the physical challenges and some of the um, the tensions around, um, uh, you know, that I just described, I think for me, finding a way and a place to stand, a way to kind of um, to trust my own point of view and really find a way to engage with this place. I'm not a Texan. I'm not a Mexican. I'm from New York, but to um, understand that I had a stake in this, that we actually all have a stake in this, in understanding our own countries better, understanding how, um, how different powers are affecting our lives. And so I think it took a couple of years for me to actually really feel like I know, I know why I'm here and I know how I'm holding my camera and I know what I'm doing. I know the photographs I'm taking and I know all the photographs that I do not want to take because there are so many stereotypes that circulate around migrants, around borders, around the American West, quote unquote, around Northern Mexico. Um, there's such a deep photographic history that is reductive and that is stereotypical. And so there were so many things I was like, there's no way I'm you know, like, I'm not taking that picture. And really finding my own um, subjective point of view was a process of discovery. Um, so you've talked about El Rio as an epic. And in our conversations while we were installing the exhibition, um, you made reference to Homer and the Odyssey, um, Herman Melville and Moby Dick, um, both stories, like all epics, I guess, which are about journeys. Um, how, could you talk a little bit about how you see the um, structure of the epic applying to El Rio and how we've actually, it's actually been presented here as an exhibition? Yeah, that's such a great question. Um, I think epic on the one hand is a, um, it refers to scale, something that's large. Um, but it's much more than that. It's really an artistic form. And um, like those two works that you just noted, and there are also epic works in music, there are epic works in all, you know, in all artistic forms. Um, but often, that kind of size of a story and the form of an epic is is a is a sort of uh, positioned around a journey. You have a protagonist who, for some reason or other, has to leave home, and the idea is they're going to go do this thing and and be right back, you know. And as they move out into the world, the world become is 
proves itself to be a very strange and complex place. And more and more things happen, and they get further and further away, and it gets harder and harder for them to get home. Mm. Um, and so this is a kind of, I think, from you know the time of classical Greece, this kind of idea of what home means and what the world means and what that... Um, the significance of that relationship, be it hostile, be it tender, be it exciting. Um, so I think there's something about the sort of um, narrative drive of an epic, if you could call mm. it that. And then if you're making something really big, you have to organize it formally. And that's an artistic challenge. Um, Al Rio, um, well, the river, the, the Rio Bravo, Rio Grande, is a great subject. And I mean that with like the capital G, like this is a great subject. It's a complex, large, um, profound subject. But a subject isn't an artwork, right? So having a great, I was like, oh, I've got a great subject. Yes, like I knew, I was like, this is juicy and I can, I can spend a lot of time with this. There's so much to dig into. Um, but as an artist, you have to make a work that actually functions. Like, it yeah. has to stand up. It has to work. Um, so eventually what I arrived at, um, as you know very well at this point, <laughs> um, is essentially a three-part structure. Um, there's a prologue, which introduces you to the water itself, to um, this is the element that we're dealing with. Um, the movement of the water. There's the main body of the work, um, which essentially um, is located within the realm of doc black and white documentary photography. It moves around with different historic references to 19th century to 20th century work, but it's that. And then there's a prologue, uh, an a coda, which um, switches into digital photography and kind of examines their iPhone photos taken off a screen and really ask questions about surveillance and about the stream of images that we now all in, live mm. w within, that we all have in our pockets right now, and that image making now is really about a screen. Mm. So I wanted to really also... Um, think about the history of photography and how photography is not only a, a, a means that records history, but the photography actually is an actor in history. Mm. How the world is framed, how it's represented, the, the images that circulate um, help form our perceptions of the world and thus it affects our politics, it affects our social attitudes. So the kind of, the really hard work of it was about um, finding a way to hold this all um, on, on the wall here. Mm. These um, single images, sequences of images, finding a rhythm and a pace that would allow this really complex subject to unfold in a way that would mm. welcome the viewer mm. and would allow you to feel some agency as you moved around in it. Yeah. I mean, just there's also this idea of stories within stories, yeah. within the story as well. And these, there are moments, there are rooms or sequences which are, they are sort of narrative stories that are, that join the bigger story of the river and you keep the river as your, as your guide, like the physical river. All, all the way along. Um, just uh, wanted to maybe um, talk a little bit about the idea of time. I mean, you know, <laughs> the big subject. Um, of course, there's the time it took to make the work, but not just shooting the photographs, but also printing the work. I mean, the time of production, the time of the studio. Um, the time of the photographs in their nature, the way you, that you were talking about as a, as a sort of, as a, not an antidote, but a resistance to the way we consume images now through the screen or the viral feed. Um, 
And the, the time when you began making it was, of course, the time of the Trump administration, which was, a, I think, a, a, a trigger of sort of background. But you've also talked about your interest in Luxembourg and how, while the work was made in a particular moment in time, historically, you see it as um, speaking to other contexts, which I would agree with. But would you like to say something about that? Um, well, I, um, I'll go back to our first conversation about this when you invited me to show this work here a number of years ago now. Um, uh, and you, I said, you know, oh, Luxembourg, like what a curious place to um, premiere this work. And I'd never been here. And you said, you know, actually, it's a city that's on a river. And you said the museum is built on this you know, the footprint of this fortification. It's a country that has three borders, uh, hundreds of thousands of people that cross every day for work and for other. Um, and, and as you were talking, I was like, oh, what a perfect place, actually, um, for all the reasons I said before about how this is really, um, these are shared concerns around the globe. Um, coming here to Luxembourg, and now we've been here about three weeks, installing the work and and preparing and 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 for today. And in free time, we've taken these long walks. My um, studio manager Jocelyn Davis, who's sitting right over there, um, and Suzanne and I took a number of really long walks around the city. And you always find yourself on a rampart. You, you know, there, there are fortifications and ramparts and walls and leftover. So this, um, the idea of the walled city and the idea of the, a, a wall, um, the ideas of borders and walls are not new. Um, and although a lot of border wall or border fence building in the U.S., was ramped up during the Trump administration and it was much more aggressively addressed in the media and much more spoken about a lot more. In fact, borders and fences have been built along the U.S.-Mexico, on the U.S. side of the U.S.-Mexico mm -hmm. border for many, many years. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's a kind of paradox somewhere in the work too that I wanted to acknowledge and and examine some of the damage that was done during those four years of administration, but also to acknowledge that this is part of a much longer mm. time frame. Mm. And that um, the river itself um, has its own sovereignty. It's been present for millennia, from long before humans were around. And then human habitation, human civilization on, on the river around, the river allowed for human civilization. Um, so a source of water in a desert. Um, so all of those um, different kinds of time, the early, the conquistadors and the early colonial history, there are these layers and layers of time um, that in a certain way you think if we're not going to look really carefully and really honestly at our situation, um, things are not going to get better. Yeah. Right? Like there's a kind of inevitability when mm. you start uncovering some mm. of the other, the historic moves that predate yeah. uh, the Trump administration. I mean, I think you know what you're saying too is so about how we can't just sort of... <clears throat> point to one particular moment and say it all started okay. there. And I think the, the photographs that you've taken and the views that you've taken also look to precisely say, well, this is a much, much longer history. And in fact, it, it underpins where we are or where we've got to now. But I love in the book too, there's a brilliant um, writer, professor of... Um, C.J. Alvarez. C.J. Alvarez, who I, he's, one of these, he's one of these writers, he's a, he's a scholar, but you kind of fall in love with him when you read his <laughs> writing. There's something about the intelligence, but the simplicity and the humanity of it. But I was really struck where he talked about these different times of the rivers, the prehistoric time, the ge geological time, um, 
the political time, um, which is a very sort of part, it's a very beautiful text that's in the book. But this notion of time is extremely important. But you say it it it, it, it leads us in and through your work, the way you've worked with that and tried to capture the river as time. I think it, it invites us precisely to begin reflecting about, well, actually, how are we, how did we get here, yeah. ultimately? Yeah. And what might we do to rethink that? Um, in terms of the exhibition itself, you took the the decision, as you did for the book, indeed, or for the image volume of the book, because the book is in two volumes, an image volume and a text volume, took the decision to not include any wall texts or labels that identify the places where you were shooting. How might someone visit, you know, looking, encountering the, ex the work in the exhibition, how might they situate what's going on in front of them? It's another really great question. Mm. And actually, before I answer it, I wanted to actually do a shout out to Marcos Corrales, who's here, who is the um, architect and exhibition designer we worked with upstairs, and who made the spaces for us to flow the photographs through. So thank you, Marcos. Um, but yes, to your question about the captions, well, about the wall text, it, in a way, it was something I had been running around in my head from the very beginning. Um, you know, what would that wall text be? How much information do I give? Um, and in a way, because the book had to go to print before we hung the exhibition, I kind of answered that in the book. Um, I started, I, I, I didn't, let's see, I didn't want people to feel completely lost. I didn't want there to be a sense of information being withheld. I didn't want it to feel, you know, obtuse or, or um, um, impossible to understand. But as I started thinking about the captions in the book and how to name these different photographs, I was like, well, do I use the... English name? Do I use the Spanish name? Do I use a historic indigenous name? Do I use the latitude and longitude? Do I use the direction I'm pointing my camera? Do I? And I realized each system of naming um, indicated a system of received knowledge that would then be giving authority to one form of authority over another form of authority. And then I thought, well, I'll. I'll say, you know, it's taken from here, looking at this, and they got really complicated. And, um, and then I, I eventually came around to thinking, you know, how helpful it is it for a, someone in a European audience to read the word Matamoros or the word Brownsville or the word Laredo? What's that going to tell them? Um, and I thought, well, the photographs themselves, um, black and white photography especially, can have a diagrammatic quality. It describes the world to you. It draws it out for you in, in, in black and white. And I thought, well, let's can the photographs do this without the caption? And it's less... From my perspective, it's less important for a viewer to know exactly where this photograph was taken than to consider a situation. This is a situation where kids and families are swimming opposite um, a, a dam and a barbed wire fence. This is a situation where goats are grazing under a bridge. This is a situation where Border Patrol agents are searching a bank. Do you need to know exactly where that bank is? Mm -hmm. I don't think that actually gets you there. Mm -hmm. um, a number of the photographs also contain text. And I left in some of those photographs as I was editing. So you would, for those who wanted to really locate themselves, there are a number of points where there's a sign or a historic marker where you can go right up to the photograph and read that historic marker and locate yourself. Or there may be, you know, 
there might there is signage or other indications. Mm. Um, so at some point we had been. Joseph Logan, our incre- like miraculously talented, beautiful collaborator who designed the book, um, we, he was like, okay, Zoe, we've really got to get on those captions now. Like, you just gotta, we've got to start feeding the titles in. And I, I was just like, you know what? I just think the book is right without it. Let's just let the language of photography speak and to recognize that each spoken or written language has its own order, and that photography, too, the language of depiction, the language of photographic depiction, has its own lexicon mm. of scale, of tone, of, um, of grain, of um, light, of shadow, of framing, mm. and just like trust that that can be legible to people, that, mm. that, that the photographs will actually do their own speaking. So it was kind of a, like a move, I was like, well, this really might not work, um, but it felt worth trying, um, yeah. And one more thing on the book, I think Nicola Van Velsen just left, but our wonderful publisher from Haja Kantz was, here a moment ago and um, worked so closely with all of us to make this book possible. It was a kind of an impossible book we made, actually, but we we made it. Um, I speaking of the book and thinking about the book and what what you were explaining about what, uh, inviting people to make their own sense of what they were seeing through both the pacing of the, the selection of images the pacing of, of them in space um, and in time, but also through your use of the language of photography and that historic language of photography, like using it, but also undoing it, reframing, all of these things. I mean, I think of it in, you know, in terms of like, po- like as a kind of poetry or, or poetics. And I loved the fact that in the um, editor's notes for the book, Tim himself again, I'm sorry we keep quoting you, but you're such an essential part of this project, but just to quote Tim Johnson, he says, poetics for me signifies the interplay of making and unmaking and applies to the temporal character in the formal structure of any work of art. I think it's like the most beautiful encapsulation of of what is happening with your work. Um, We've sort of covered a lot of things. I'm I'm conscious that... um, you need to see this exhibition. <laughs> but a uh, couple, couple of quick questions uh, for you, Zoe, if you can bear it. Um, we, you've talked a lot about photography as a medium and, and you've been an avid student of photography. You really know what it is to make a photograph. And the exhibition itself, as Zoe mentioned earlier, um, constitutes a, a sort of corpus of around 300 uh, black and white silver gelatin photographs, hand printed by a master printer, um, F- Laurent Girard. Laurent, France via New York via LA. Um, and um, a series of color C prints, which is the prologue. Uh, and then a series of digital prints, um, which forms the coda um, of the exhibition, a kind of epilogue or coda, so in terms of the tripartite structure. Um, and I um, was so, we, we talked about how we had worked for so long on this exhibition um, because of COVID, we were working at a distance and with my co-curators, Christophe Galois and Sarah Beaumont and with our colleagues, um, Deborah Lambolez and Clarice Fatman here on the publication with Haja Kantz and Tim and um, Joseph, we would be looking at sort of things on the screen and we could get a sense of like the stunning aspect of the images and their textures and Zoe would send me like um, messages, like phone messages like, we had this ama- these prints are incredible and I'd be looking at them on my phone screen and thinking, I can really tell they have this incredible depth of focus and texture but when the real, because we spaced out all of the exhibition working with printouts, digital printouts, so I sort of mapped it all out and had a few crazy, <laughs> few meltdown moments, um, <laughs> which was part of any installation. Um, 
But when the real prince, the silver gelatin prince came out, it was absolutely amazing. I mean, it was sort of, I remember almost sort of falling backwards. I was so stunned by their, their physical presence and insistence. Um, it was sort of absolutely remarkable things. But um, all of that sort of lead into um, CODA, which of course is at the end, and CODA as in, well, the work has finished, but there's just one more thing. Mm -hmm. So could you tell us, talk to us about CODA and its significance in El Rio? Sure. Um, yeah, and in terms of the print quality, I, yeah, this, I, I worked in the darkroom, I did my own darkroom work for about 25 years, but now I work with a couple of master printers. So um, the black and white is Laurent Girard, and the color is Eric Weeks. And actually, Coda was printed by our very own Jocelyn Davis in the studio. Um, in a quick, there was a little um, format change, and we had to reprint something on the on the on the fast. Um, so they wouldn't look this good if it weren't for the brilliance of those um, master printers and and the length of our relationship. Like we, it's a, um, um, it's not like, oh, you just drop them off and pick them up and they're done. It's a whole really involved conversation about what I want out of the photograph and Laurent will show me something. It's a, it's a back and forth. It's a really long process to arrive at. We were printing, we're actually in production for 16 months we were printing. And I mean, we're, t we're talking prints going back and forth every week for that entire 16 months. It was a really, um, yeah, it's, a, it's, um, it's, and it's, I think and not a lot of people really print that way anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, um, but anyway, I just wanted to sort of give that, fill that out a little bit of like why those prints look so good. Like those color flowers, like that's mm -hmm. Eric Weeks, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, CODA, um, that came into the work also very late. The idea was really um, the prologue and then this, um, you know, from El Paso down, you know, what is all the way down to the Gulf. And then when you get to the mouth and you, the, the river pours out into the Gulf of Mexico, my intention was to end the work there. Um, At some point I thought like that's, it's a, it's an impossibly romantic ending to this. It's, you know, the, the beauty of the ocean and I mean, you can't take a bad picture of the ocean. It's just, you know, it's really cinematic. It's really, film responds to that condition really well. And I thought, you know, this is such a kind of thing that we do in our society where we like look to the ocean to solve all our problems. Oh, so just, you know, you're upset, take a walk along the beach, you have some garbage, throw it in the ocean. We just sort of look to the ocean to solve all of our problems, to take all of our problems. And in art, it is always asked to stand in for the eternal and the endless power. And it's, you know, the subject that goes back to the very beginnings of art making. And I thought, well, it's really beautiful and I want to have that moment and allow the beauty of this moment of this river arriving in to the Gulf, which means that then it's connected to the Atlantic, which means it's then connected to the rest of the world. That feels like a powerful and important moment. Um, but I think there is a kind of meta space um, that CODA provides. Um, a couple of years into the project, um, before one trip or another, I was researching one of the bridges, and I just wanted to know you know when it was built and what was what was that crossing going to look like. I Google I've Google driven that whole drive. I can't tell you how many times, like how many 3 a.m. I'm like, let me just Google drive through Laredo, <laughs> like. It's like complete lunacy. Um, but I discovered that when I went to research this bridge that they had a website and that on the website you could click on a link that took you to a quote-unquote bridge cam, and which is an open stream of a camera showing people crossing back and forth and in some cases showing traffic. 
the ostensible use of this is that if you want to cross from one side to the other, you can go to this website and see how long of a wait is it, how crowded is this bridge. Um, this is common practice all over the world now. Given the kind of heated and tense situation at the US-Mexico border, the idea of that kind of surveillance although it was supposedly benign, because it's just about checking how long you have to wait at the border, I thought, this is very strange that I can be sitting in my apartment in New York or wherever, and that I can be watching people crossing, going to work, going to school. Um, and I became really obsessed with these cameras, and I started, <laughs> I mean, when you're not streaming junk on like Netflix, you might as well watch a bridge cam for five hours, <laughs> you know. Um, so I, I started watching them and I was like, you know, I think this has a place. I think this has a place in the work and I don't know what it is. So I just, whenever I don't know what to do with something, I just start taking pictures of it because that's like how I figured out. So I started photographing and um, but the analog pictures, uh, they just weren't right. And eventually, when I was dealing with this question of the end, I thought, oh, there's this other step, which is about a digital space. It's about a meta space of how what happens at our borders and what we agree to in our governments in those situations does not remain sighted there. It's not gonna stay at the border. It's part of this stream of information and it's also, I think it's a metaphor for the way that the, the attitudes and the, <clears throat> the kind of <clears throat> behaviors that we accept at our borders reflect who we are as a people and in fact they come home with us they follow us home so how you treat your neighbor that's you know it follows you home and so I thought that the the structure wise to give the viewer this moment of like we've got the mouth we're at the ocean it's glorious it's beautiful and then like oh there's this one other room um, that talks about this, um, uh, the conceptual space that we all occupy together that has to do with, um, with, with, with governance, with information, with surveillance, with the image world that we all live in, with questions of privacy, with questions of citizenship. And so it felt like a really important way to also, they're, they're in color. I shot them with my iPhone. And I, th I had been shooting them for a couple of years, but I reshot them all. This, what's on the wall here was all shot in one day, September 27th, by chance, um, in September, you know, this last fall. Um, so you can see people wearing masks. I wanted to bring the work like right up into the here and now. Um, black and white, and, and you know, over time, this will be dated, but it'll be dated to a certain moment in time. Mm. Black and white photography can feel oddly timeless. Mm. Here, is this the 70s? Is this the 19th century? And these, you know right when we are. Mm. And I thought there's a couple of photographs where you can actually read the name of the website. I wanted to be really transparent about what it was, that this is my laptop, this is this screen feed, and this is what we're... Uh, what we're watching. We're watching people going to school and going to work. Um, yeah. Um, it's just sort of in closing just to say that this, again, um, as I began um, with the um, sharing with you, this is the very first time that El Rio has been presented to the world um, uh, as a work um, and as an exhibition. So, uh, and it will subsequently travel to the Museum of Modern Art of, um, in Paris, the Musée d'Art Moderne de la Ville de Paris. We're delighted to have um, the curators of, of the exhibition, the presentation in Paris there, and they have been vi absolutely vital partners with, with Moudam on, on the preparation and the production of the exhibition and, and of the book. 
Um, but for you, Zoe, I mean, thinking about your previous um, epic photographic works, you know, is this the final form? Mm, stay tuned. <laughs> I think with that, maybe that's a good moment to <laughs> close. We need some, we like a bit of suspense. <laughs> and um, I think, you know, just to allow you to visit the exhibition and um, thank you for coming. I think, will you join me in thanking Zoe Leonard for being here? Thank you.